Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about why do my joints hurt is Dr. Alejandro Badia. Dr. Badia is a hand and upper extremity surgeon, author, and healthcare entrepreneur in Doral, Miami, Florida. In 2008, he created the Badia Hand to Shoulder Center, and in 2010, he launched OrthoNow, the first immediate orthopedic care center in South Florida. Dr. Badia has outlined his journey and delved into the major challenges and hurdles of delivering healthcare in the U.S. through his Amazon best-selling book, Healthcare from the Trenches, published during the COVID-19 pandemic. How are you doing today, Dr. Badia? I'm great. How are you, Jason? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to our conversation. Before we get started, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, we will have time for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, type your questions in, and we will get those answered at the end of the webinar. So Dr. Brady, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why do my joints hurt? Wonderful. Thank you, Jason. Well, this is a, obviously a broad topic. Um, there are many causes for joint pain. We're going to discuss that and discuss the treatment. Okay. So, so one more. Uh, Natural, but I think as we get older, we realize that we, when we overdo it a bit, whether it be sports or hobbies such as gardening and kneeling down for a long period of time, your knees may hurt, or your back may hurt, um, and that is, um, you know, that that's that's part of the process of aging. Although I am reading a book by Sinclair now about about uh, longevity, so very interesting that all of these things may change in the coming decades. But for now, there's no question that uh, as we get older, you know, joints do hurt. Uh, it can be from acute injury uh, or, uh, or chronic and old injury, maybe an old, you know, dive, maybe an old football injury or something. Uh, or it can be part of the disease process. So whether it be something like Lyme disease, which largely affects the joints, or even, even COVID um, as, a, as a viral syndrome can affect joints, even a common cold. We talk about myalgias. A lot of times, it's more uh, joint pain than muscle pain. And then arthritis. We're going to go. We're going to delve a little bit into really what that means and what the ramifications of that are. So it, much like appendicitis, which is inflammation of your appendix, arthritis simply arthro, which is joint, and inflammation. And, and many times there is swelling or inflammation associated, but sometimes it could be just pain. And when we talk about arthritis, usually we mean that there is loss of the of the cartilage. The cartilage is that shiny white surface you see on the end of the chicken bone, for example. When you're eating chicken, it's that very glistening. And in fact, we we still really uh, mankind has not found a material that has less friction even than natural uh, occurring hyaline or joint cartilage. So it is an amazing, amazing material. And in, in, in some people, it just starts to wear away. Um, so it can be related to an inflammatory disease, such as, say, gout or psoriatic arthritis or a bunch of different types of inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, which is the most common. But most of the time, we're talking about osteoarthritis. People refer to that as arthritis of aging or wear and tear. Um, actually, it's not really true. You, you can be in your late 30s, early 40s, develop mild osteoarthritis. Um, there are people who are in their late 80s who have minimal uh, arthritis, although that is uncommon. So it is typically related to aging. Um, it can be, as I mentioned, viral. It can be uh, an infectious cause. So there are many, many different causes of joint pain and, and arthritis, which is what I think what we'll focus on for most of the talk is, is one of them. Uh, but of course, you can have it from a, a viral syndrome, as I already mentioned with COVID, and other systemic diseases such as hypothyroidism or, 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 or gout or even, even diabetes. A classic one in hemarthrosis is when there's blood in the joint, and that's typical of hemophilia. Uh, from the history buffs, that was uh, one of the things that actually brought down the Russian uh, Empire uh, was the hemophilia in, uh, in the son of, uh, of the Tsar. So these are really important conditions. Um, here is just a graphic showing the normal joint, which, which has a capsule. There's synovial fluid inside it. You see the blue is the normal joint lining. And in osteoarthritis, the primary problem is the wearing away for reasons we still do not know. We, we spend uh, billions on research for this, but we still don't really know why some people develop osteoarthritis. And then rheumatoid arthritis does have a genetic component. Uh, there's a, a gene called uh, HD4, and there's 
Uh, there's others, and, and we're learning a lot more, and, and some of the new drugs uh, really, really impact rheumatoid arthritis. And this is a condition that is very special to me. I probably became a ham surgeon because of rheumatoid arthritis. Here's my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, originally from Valencia, Spain. Uh, this was, I believe, a photo in New Jersey where I grew up, and she's with my grandfather. And you notice she's not showing her hands. And I, until I was old, I didn't realize that she wouldn't, uh, she typically wouldn't show her hands in pictures. And that's because they were very deformed. And I'll show you at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a typical example of that. And surgery does work very well, but these new drugs called uh, disease-modifying agents, uh, Humira, uh, Embryo, all of these actually really affect and slow down the disease process, thank goodness. But this is a, a huge economic issue as well. Uh, as the population ages, uh, we're getting healthier, which is great, but that just means there's probably going to be a higher prevalence of arthritis. So it's important to really address this problem. And I talk a lot about these societal healthcare issues in my book. I, Jason mentioned I, I came out with a, a book during, I wrote 90% of it during the lockdown last year. So it was released just over a year ago. Um, and it's called Healthcare from the Trenches. You can find it on Amazon. But I talk a lot about uh, these societal issues and, and, and as well as economic costs and how our healthcare system in the US has become uh, too cumbersome, uh, way too cumbersome. And, um, and we, you know, we really need to, to do something about it, uh, different than what, really different than what our politicians are talking about. So in terms of arthritis, we usually start with anti-inflammatories. Uh, that can be NSAIDs, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that can be, uh, say, Advil or Aleve. And uh, oral steroids are very effective, but they do, have, they do have some side effects. And I mentioned the DMAs that usually are used for rheumatoid and similar types of arthritis. Uh, you can get injections. Uh, one thing I didn't put here, and I should have, is only because I started doing it a lot more in the last year, is I'm using infant biologics that, that can include PRP, Platelet-rich plasma, where I draw your, your blood, we spin in the centrifuge and inject the concentrated platelets and plasma back in, and we can put, put it directly into a joint, and that will uh, really retard the arthritic process and help with pain. Uh, it's certainly more costly than a regular steroid injection, but the problem with cortisone and similar agents actually accelerates, in many cases, the disease process. So it's very important to be aware of that. Uh, therapies are very useful just, just for emotion and strength, but it's not going to really affect the arthritis itself. So important to understand that, and as well as splinting. Splinting is for comfort, uh, but uh, a splint sometimes may just make you stick. And then there's surgical treatment, which is extremely effective and something not talked about much because, um, you know, frankly, my colleagues in primary care, I think they're not a, a, as aware of, of what, what we're going to do nowadays. And that's our fault as physicians. We often don't, don't educate each other enough that affects uh, you, the patients. So uh, in fact, there's an interesting article by a colleague of mine, uh, Kevin Chung, who's a chairman at, uh, from Michigan, who, who wrote about what, how rheumatologists perceive uh, hand reconstruction of the rheumatoid arthritis with these deformities that my grandmother had. And, um, and I talked about her case in the first chapter of my book. So I I I uh, I you to read that and you'll enjoy it. And I talk about how I went to see a hand surgeon with her when I was eight years old. Uh, but yet the rheumatologist, I don't think realize what our results can be. And then many times us hand surgeons aren't as aware of, of what medications can do. So we, we we need to come together. And I talk about that in the book as well. So surgical treatments can include simply sinovectomy, meaning removing the joint lining, excuse me. Removing the joint lining, and that can be done open or arthroscopic, which happens to be one of my particular areas of interest in, in the hand surgery field, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that later. Now, we can also fuse a joint, and for some joints, that works very well. A good example is the last joint. Many of you look at your, your finger, the last joint, you probably have a little, little bump or a knob there, and that is typical of osteoarthritis, and that's called a Hebridin's nose. There is no joint replacement for this last joint. So there we fuse it. We get rid of the motion, but that gets rid of the pain. We take away the bumps. Uh, it's a not simple outpatient procedure. But most of the time, you know, patients prefer motion, of course. And uh, most of the joints now in the upper limb uh, don't undergo fusion. 
Many years ago, we used to fuse the neutral. Uh, some of you may remember having a relative who would sit down at a family reunion and stick his leg straight out. That's because he couldn't bend it. Now all of you know that we do knee replacements. And we all talk about that because I'm not a, I'm not a lower limb surgeon, but obviously I'm gonna mention the most common joint replacement, at least in the US, is a knee replacement followed by the hip. But I'll be talking about shoulder and elbow and other uh, sort of less discussed things. And that's called arthroplasty. Plasty means change. So that's where we place, we change or replace the joint. Um, and it can be with synthetic materials as a prosthesis. Now here is arthroscopy of very small joints, something that uh, even my colleagues in hand surgery, a lot of them actually do not do this. I've, I've been kind of a pioneer in, in, in some of the particular procedures. So this is the small joint in the thumb, the metacarpal phalangeal joint. I also spoke this joint, which we'll talk about later. That's the most common one I do actually. And this is the knuckle in the index finger. So you see here in the camera, here's the, the joint surface and right here is the, the synovitis. So I'm removing that physically with two little holes that I don't even put a stitch in. So when people think about surgery, they, they imagine this big deal. This is a 20 minute outpatient procedure with no scar. So what, once these little holes here, you, you don't even see them. So we have to change, I think, our perception about what surgery means. There are many joints uh, again, that benefit from all these surgical procedures. We talked about hip and knee, which are the most common, but me being a hand surgeon, upper limb surgeon, I do a lot of shoulder replacements. I don't do a lot of hip replacements, not it's mostly for rheumatoid patients, and then some of these other joints mentioned here. So arthroscopy, as I mentioned, it allows us to clean up the joint or take out the, the joint lining, which uh, produces the chemicals that your brain interprets as pain. So we can do a synovectomy or remove the, the joint lining. That will give uh, excellent pain relief. The question will be how long it will last, and that depends on what the underlying problems are. So we can do this in shoulder, elbow, wrist, the base of the thumb, which is the, the, the thumb carpal metacarpal joint, and these small joints here called the metacarpal phalangeal joints. So shoulder pain, people often think it's arthritis. Uh, in this case, it is. But many times, it's, it's a rotator cuff problem uh, associated with bursitis. That is not arthritis. Arthritis is when there's loss of the joint. So we're seeing that here, a very narrow joint, and there's a prosthesis. And this gentleman was so happy with his left shoulder, he came and had his right done. He's from the Cayman Islands. He's actually a manual worker, strong guy, and he's got a scar here, and he, you can barely see it. And he had both of his shoulders replaced. Now, this is a rotator cuff tear. You can see this bright signal is fluid right in the cuff or the, or the tendon of the supraspinatus, one of the four rotator cuff muscles that gets degenerative. Uh, simply, you know, with time and what, many times with age, and it can detach. And that is a more common cause of shoulder pain. And this is treated like this with arthroscopy with three little holes in the joint. I've had both my shoulders scoped. So I can tell you that this is not, not uncommon. Here's another type of prosthesis where it's half the joint. And then this is a total joint replacement. In this case, this is called the reverse shoulder, uh, soon becoming more common than the standard shoulder replacement, where we put, we put the head not, not on the humerus here, but we put the head here. And in this case, that's because there, is no, there was a, a rotator cuff tear a long time ago that could have been treated, um, and, and it didn't. And then what happens is joint wears away. Elbow pain, uh, actually arthritis is quite common, more common rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes osteoarthritis, but the common cause of elbow pain, joint pain, is not really the joint. It's, it's, you probably all heard of tennis elbow. In fact, mine, mine is flaring up now. I had it 30 years ago and uh, mine's been hurting me. So I'm about to get an injection of, of, of plasma probably this coming week. Um, I'll actually do it myself because I use augmented reality. I use these goggles where I can see the ultrasound. I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a procedure called Tenex. Uh, this has been groundbreaking. This is for tennis and golfer's elbow. You can use it for certain types of bursitis, uh, Achilles and patellar tendonitis in the lower extremity, uh, even plantar fasciitis, pain in the foot. Uh, but the, the most common reason I use it as an upper limb surgeon is 
is tennis elbow. Uh, elbow replacement, again, uncommon. Uh, this is an elbow arthroscopy. So this is in the elbow. There are two little holes. I'm going in and I'm cleaning out the joint line. You can see it's inflamed, that orange, uh, reddish tissue to the right. This is, uh, this is what causes the inflammation and pain in the joint. The joint itself doesn't look bad. This is the cartilage. Uh, this is this is pretty a pretty good condition. Okay. In the wrist, same thing. We do we can also do arthroscopically. We do synovectomies, agreements. Uh, sometimes we can fuse it or do partial fusions, um, which is which is a, a big advance. Uh, in the rheumatoid disease, we do open removal of all that inflammation. We don't have time to go into that in detail, but understand there are different types of, of wrist arthritis, just like in all the joints. And uh, this is uh, uh, after conservative management. These are the different types of surgery, including, as I mentioned, a partial fusion. So you need this small, small scar here. This person had their wrist partially fused, so they, they don't have all the motion. They have a little bit. Wrist arthroscopy is the same as what you saw in the shoulder and elbow is, is through a small camera. And then we'll talk here about the thumb, which is the most common place in the hand for osteoarthritis. Uh, very common to women, about two to one women to men. A uh, has to do with a little bit looser ligaments they see in women. And there are many options. Um, a fusion we mentioned, and we do that in the labels, remove this bone. That's what most, if any of you have had this and have gone to a, an orthopedist or hand surgeon, they'll, they'll talk about removing this bone called the trapezium. And, and that's actually a good operation. It takes a long time to recover. So I've been doing arthroscopy for a long time. You can see there's a camera in the joint. Uh, I even described 15 years ago, as I mentioned, I'm, 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 I've been one of the people who's really pushed small joint arthroscopy. So 15 years ago, I published this treatment algorithm and a classification for the stages of arthritis. So this is what it looks like inside. You see a loss of cartilage and here in the middle, uh, the cartilage is red and thin. Now this is a very advanced case. Here we do not do arthroscopy. And in this patient, I did a, a traditional open removal of this this bone called the trapezium, which looks like a pancake. It should look like this, but you can see there's no joint space here like there is here. Here there's a joint, here there's really no joint because the cartilage is worn down. And then this is what I've been doing for the last few years more and more because the patients do so well. So here it is a rheumatoid reconstruction. This is a, the type of problem my grandmother, my grandmother's hands look like this. In fact, I, I, if I recall worse. So here, this is a, um, this is a lady from Peru many years ago who come to me. So this is the post op visit. You can see this the small incisions where I put in new joints. But look at how the fingers are straight. Before the left hand was actually worse than the right. You see the big difference. And these are the joint replacements. These are made out of silicone, believe it or not. Okay. And we already mentioned small joint arthroscopy, so we do it in multiple joints. This is a, a gentleman who used, was a, a professional race car driver from Bolivia, and he's a South American champion. He had terrible pain in both these joints. And you can see this is, you can still see the, the surgical um, uh, cleaner here, the betadine is still on the hand. Because this was about three days after surgery. And he told me he hadn't slept in six months because of the pain, and, and, and for the first time, he had pain relief. So it's a matter of educating the public. Uh, Jason mentioned orthonality. You know, orthonality is, in, is a, walk-in orthopedic center. We're hoping to bring them around the country. Uh, so we are uh, hoping to have one on the West Coast in California soon. But in Miami, there's three of these, and you can just walk in and get assessed and then be sent to the right surgeon if you need surgery. But most people don't need surgery, thank goodness. Um, and they can have an injection there, uh, therapy, have splints, et cetera. Um, and just, you might want to write this down um, at orthonal care, you can actually do a telemedicine consult where you have knee pain and you can see an orthopedic uh, clinician who will get you started in terms, of, uh, in terms of assessment and treatment. And we're doing this, of course, with workers, uh, with work-related injuries. So orthonal is gonna, is gonna really change how orthopedic care is delivered. It all comes down to trust, the, uh, you know, if, if the public, uh, and we, we, we need to regain that trust. The, the media has always been friendly to us in the medical profession in the last uh, decade. So I'm hoping that changes uh, because really we need to work together in order to combat these 
major problems of, of joint pain and, and certainly arthritis. Uh, what is the first thing I should do if I begin to experience joint pain? Well, I think the important thing is to make the diagnosis, right? Because joint pain is just a symptom uh, and it can be due to a variety of different things. So I, I think the main thing is to see the right type of specialist. Certainly you can start with your primary care physician, but if, uh, if issues persist, uh, I, would, I would probably see a, uh, an orthopedist. Uh, if it seems like it's a disease, meaning more than just joints hurt, other things hurt, uh, including your joints, then you might want to see a rheumatologist who is a, uh, who is a doctor for rheumatologic or autoimmune diseases, of which rheumatoid arthritis is one. Yeah, you had mentioned that. Uh, are there other autoimmune diseases that, um, you know, you may be kind of predisposed for uh, joint pain? Yeah, there's many. I mean, one is, for example, uh, it's called ankylosing spondylitis. Spondylitis means inflammation of the spine. So that uh, AES typically causes uh, back pain, but it can also affect the knees, hips, um, elbows. I've seen it in. So, and then psoriatic people have psoriasis with mm -hmm. little spots. Many times they can have a related uh, arthritis or pain in the joint on top of the skin problem. So it all has to do with. Uh, really, with, again, with autoimmune, it's it, almost that the body's immune system uh, starts to attack the, the joints itself. A very complex problem. All right. As a caregiver to someone who has arthritis, what things do I need to be aware of to be a better caregiver, Dr. Perdino? Well, you know, a lot of patients need to be transferred, right, mobilized, and um, particularly if they're on steroids, the, the skin is going to be very, very thin. You have to be careful. You can actually tear it in, in trying to just help somebody into, say, uh, the, the, you know, into a tub or a shower. Um, and and you have to, you know, learn how to how to to, to uh, transfer lift patients because you may exacerbate the joint pain naturally. And I think the important thing is that when patients have, uh, you know, re unremitting and, and constant pain, to so just make sure they're seen by the right type of specialist. I find that's you know, a, a mistake people make. Uh, you, you've got to do a little bit of research. And fortunately, nowadays, it, it, you can find it on the web. All right. How does someone determine if they are a candidate for surgery or just need medication or therapy? Uh, great, great question. That's, that is, you know, that's a question we ask ourselves. When a patient sees me, I'm not thinking surgery is actually a course. Um, I'm, I'm, I start conservative treatment, uh, different, different types of oral agents. We see how they respond to that, how they respond to activity modification. Right? There's certain things that, you know what, maybe, maybe you, you, know, you shouldn't be kneeling when you're, when you're gardening. Uh, you know, find a different position, have, have somebody help you with that aspect. Um, and then uh, therapy can help because it gets the joint supple and gets the surrounding muscle strong. When all these conservative measures fail, depending on what we see on an x-ray and, and sometimes an MRI, but generally you don't even need that. Physical exam and an MRI, many times we start with arthroscopy. So again, we often don't even call that surgery. It's, I call it a procedure because it's, it's two little holes, allows me to diagnose the problem and resolve it to some degree all in one sitting. Yeah. Can someone be too old, Dr. Badia, to be a candidate for joint replacement? And that's you know it's kind of a great question. I mean, the answer potentially is yes. If, if a patient is old and has a lot of systemic medical issues, it, it, it could be um, some danger for them, right? But for the most part, no. I mean, our belief is that there's no reason for somebody suffering pain. I've done a number of surgeries over the years for some for people in their 90s uh, who are very happy afterwards. Uh, nowadays, surgery is so much less risky because we, we do blocks. You know, we don't even do general anesthesia many times. So, so surgeries are much safer than they used to be. So I, I really believe that it's more your physiological interest, what your, your system is like rather than your numerical know, risk. Does arthritis impact men and women equal? Depends on the type of arthritis. Uh, osteoarthritis is pretty equal. Depends on the joint. I believe, uh, for example, in men, it's a little more common in the knee. Then women, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is more of a disease, is, is significantly more common in women. Uh, so it really depends on the, on the type of arthritis. 
what about the role that your your diet or vitamins plays in joint pain? Great question. I think we're only really delving into this now. One of the uh, failures of our uh, allopathic medical education, in the traditional uh, MD education, we don't concentrate enough on nutrition. Um, and and I think that's changing now. Most of the younger doctors get more training, and and <laughs> those of us not so young are, are reading a lot more. I I I read I read, I just read a book called Unconventional Medicine. And even the Cleveland Clinic opened a whole uh, functional medicine program um, on, on the hospital campus in Cleveland, you know, basically saying, hey, as traditional medical caregivers, we recognize the, the uh, effect of nutrition and, and uh, other related issues. So I'm, uh, I, I definitely, I'm about to put myself on a regimen now after this book I read by uh, Sinclair. You mentioned the primary care provider, Dr. Badia. How soon after seeing a primary care provider and not seeing any uh, any betterment, if you will, to your joint pain, should they ask or should you ask to come see a doctor like yourself? Yeah, I would say you, you've got to give a conservative treatment, you know, NSAIDs and, and rehab and other probably a good four to six weeks. But I, I would not wait months because if you get, you have to understand that the, the primary care doctors are a difficult position, right? They have to know, you know, a lot about everything. And, and there's too much to know. I have family members are asking about their back. And I, I say, you know what? I trained as an orthopedic surgeon 25 years ago, but what's being done now with back pain is so incredible. You really need to see a spine specialist. And, um, you know, if you're having persistent pain. If, if it's not going better, you really need to um, discuss this with your primary care doctor. Or do some research yourself on the web. And sometimes, you know, patients need to reach out to a, a, an orthopedist uh, directly. And, 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 you know, that's one of the great things about ortho now. You can just walk in with ortho now and, and get routed to the, to the right person. Uh, and that's something I think we're going to see more of in our healthcare system. And I, I talk about that in my book in terms of specialized walk in centers, or, you know, women's centers where they can go ahead and just walk in and get a pap smear and get an initial diagnosis. And then followed by their family, say, you know, uh, OBGYN. And it's gonna be the same in many different disciplines in medicine. Yeah, last question, Dr. Padilla, you, you touched on this, but as you mentioned, we are an aging population. Are there uh, certain types of joint pain that are more common, like knee or, or shoulder or hip? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the most common in terms of osteoarthritis, by far the most common cause of arthritis. And as you mentioned, as, as the population ages, that is the more common one. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the, the typical form actually develops, you know, can develop in the teens and in, in, in the late 20s. Uh, in terms of osteoarthritis, generally relating to aging. And, you know, let's face it, we walk, except for my Cirque du Soleil patients, most of us walk on our, on our, on our, uh, on our feet and our legs, right? And typically osteoarthritis of the knee and, and the hip, you're gonna feel those are the most common. Um, but in terms of the upper limb, it's important to make the diagnosis because we're not walking on our hands, but you can have, as I showed, you can have primary arthritis in the shoulder, uh, sometimes even, even the knee and certainly the base of the thumb, which is very common and has little to do with activity, even though that's a misconception. It has nothing to do with what you do. Some people just develop this base of the thumb pain. Yeah. So, Dr. Bria, you said a way for people to reach you. Um, uh, go to the website, right? Yeah, that's I, I. I tend to answer myself for the most part, uh, so that's really the easy way. Right? You go to drbria.com and it says uh, there's a box there. I think it says Ask Dr. Bria, and there's one where you can schedule a telemedicine appointment. Yeah, and also and, on your website, besides for the wonderful videos, you also have a link, a web page for your book too. That's right. Yeah, the book is just, you, you can find it on my website or, or you can just put in Dr. Badia book. And that's a website where there's actual uh, videos of each chapter. And they're, they're only a minute and a half to two minutes. So it's just a way to understand what each chapter in the book is about and hopefully stimulates people to read about it and, and you know, contact us. I, I, uh, I want the dialogue because, you know, our healthcare system is approaching 20% of our GDP, our, our gross domestic product. That's twice as expensive as the next country in line, which is, which is Switzerland or Norway. So this is not sustainable. We, we need to have a dialogue. I'm proud to say I'm actually having breakfast with 
Senator Bill Cassidy next week at the Capitol uh, because he read my book. And you know, he's a physician himself, one of the three doctors in the Senate. And uh, you know, Rand Paul is another one. And we, we need to do something about the healthcare system. And the current dialogue is not getting it done. Discussing who we're going to insure and not insure, that's not a way to lower costs. The way to lower costs is to change how we deliver healthcare, make it less complex, less cumbersome, and cut out a lot of middle, middle people. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Dr. Berdia. Um, as far as knowledgeable aging, uh, you can go to our website, knowledgeableaging.com, see all of our upcoming and archive webinars. Go to YouTube, type in knowledgeable aging, encourage you to subscribe. We do update that as much as we can a couple times per week. Um, if podcasts are your thing, you can find us on Apple Tunes, Spotify. Until next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging.